that? Antidote. To what? The poison you just drank. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Good late afternoon. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 56. Huh. I am his poisoner, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. <laughs> And that's the robot, R-080T. And I am Announcer Man. And our trusty, ever, professional Announcer Man. He is professional, isn't he? He is. Even though we don't pay him. Warning! Today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. <laughs> oh, you're looking at me. Today's episode is His Poisoner by Sean Eads. Sean Eads is a reference librarian who lives in Denver, Colorado. He's 36 years old, and when he started writing seriously at the age of 14, he was sure literary success would come quickly. Reality and lowered expectations have since set in. His writing has appeared online in Reflections Edge and the Oregon Literary Review. An essay on Stephen King's Salem's Lot is scheduled to appear in the first 2010 issue of the Journal of Popular Culture. He also freelance writes for a few magazines. You can find him on Facebook. Today's story was produced by Brian Lincoln, who also did the editing and the narration for the story, and we'd like to thank him for that. We'd also like to thank Abigail Hilton, Liz Lincoln, Sarah Slater, and John Rendeau, hopefully that's how you say your name, if not, I'm very sorry, John, for lending their voices to today's episode. His Poisoner by Sean Eads Someone's poisoned me. Jake held himself over the sink and leaned toward his reflection. Did that thought really just run behind those eyes? My eyes? Who would want to poison me? Do I have an enemy? One who despises me enough to become an assassin? He saw the answer in the skein of inflamed blood vessels crisscrossing around his irises like cracks in fine white china. They worked themselves into a name. Susan. Susan was responsible. But how? He'd seen her only twice since their relationship went bust three months ago, the first time they did not even acknowledge each other. But the second time, just two weeks ago. The cafe. The coffee. A shuffle of feet outside had Jake spinning toward the door in shaky composure. No one entered, but this was just a brief respite. He would not have the bathroom to himself much longer. His company had 300 employees on this floor alone. Jake took a sharp breath. He'd retreat to the stalls if they had mirrors. More than anything, he needed his face in front of him. Only the gravity of his gray reflection fixed his thoughts from orbiting into madness. The coffee. His wan cheeks lost still more vitality as he pondered how Susan had destroyed him. How could she have poisoned the coffee? He had never left her alone with his drink. The cup was in his hand the entire time. Except for... He remembered now. She encouraged him to get the caramel macchiato, saying it sounded good. He should have seen through the ruse when she asked to taste it. She left a dramatic lipstick smudge on the rim. She must have known he'd place his lips over that trace of glory in stealing the kiss she'd sworn to never give again. In doing so, he took the poison into his stomach, into his blood and brain. Jake returned to the mirror and saw everything. The lipstick. Susan. His poisoner. Her poison. Her kiss. He splashed icy water across his face and immediately retched again, the tidal pain coming fierce like a shank in the guts. He gripped the sink edge to steady himself. His poisoner's identity no longer mattered with his death so imminent. Perhaps the knowledge was somehow part of the poisoning, part of some internal revenge packet that released itself in strategic stages. First the nausea, then the blinding pain and sweating, 
the vomiting, and at last the name of his executioner like a bullet in the head. I'm dying. The pain increased to a white blindness that had him squinting and gritting his teeth until he wished and wept for death. Then all at once it eased and ended. Jake hunched over with his head nearly in the sink, his heaving torso all lungs. Still no one entered. The men on his floor seemed not to take piss breaks, but Jake didn't press his luck. He pushed himself up to find his face soaked and ill, but relaxed the way a tortured man, his interrogation just over, sags lethargically in his restraints. This isn't over. You're racing a clock, Jake, and you don't know where its hands are. His suffering had built over three days now, but even a week could not appease Susan's vanity or rage. The killing blow must come later. But how much later? He remembered their final fight. How blind he'd been to think Susan would ever sit down for coffee with him after the things she said. At the time, Jake assumed she realized her mistakes. Now he knew the truth. Recalling the bitter acrimony of their war, Jake now saw months of suffering ahead of him. He shuffled into a stall, flipped open his cell phone, and dialed Susan's number. He waited for her voicemail and spoke low as if in a confessional. I'm on to you now, he said. He swallowed. I happen to know a medical expert. She'll find the cure. And when she finds the cure, I'm going to ask her out. And I'm going to buy her every single gift I ever got you. Only more expensive. But even if she doesn't find the cure, bitch, killing me isn't your revenge. Dying more beloved than you'll ever be is mine. Jake returned to his cubicle and the interrupted lunch left there. He took pains opening the remaining tinfoil package only to discover a lumpy and sloppily composed burrito, half its contents spilling forth as if from a slit wineskin. He frowned. People took no pride in their food, and the burrito was cold. Going to the microwave carried too much risk. Anyone might recognize the burrito as their burrito. Could they fire him for the theft? Jake mulled this as his fingers plucked a piece of chicken from the unfolding tortilla and dropped it into his mouth. He had never been caught, so he supposed the first time he could feign ignorance. In his experience, however, indignation was the better weapon. Your burrito? This is my burrito. Oh, really? Well, I made one just like it. Great. I guess this means that my burrito has been stolen. I demand a full investigation right away. He ate fast, chewing without tasting as he hunkered closer to his desk. He had never taken someone's entire meal before. Stealing the whole thing betrayed everything about the system he'd crafted over the last 18 months. He called this system the nibble, and it worked precisely because it wasn't greedy. Usually, Jake preyed on lunches and Tupperware dishes. He could pinch from this one and that one, maybe two forkfuls of spaghetti, two spoonfuls of potato salad, and a dollop of someone's chocolate pudding. Altogether, these small thefts made for an impressive meal, and never raised the suspicions of his donors. The nibble had seen Jake through many successful lunches and saved hundreds of dollars. He would return to his cubicle... Rarely was he brazen enough to linger in a staff room and smile, his plate full, eating while he thought of himself as a vampire bat. He'd seen footage of them parked innocuously on the sides of unsuspecting cattle, lapping just a little innocent blood before moving on down the herd. They were his inspiration. Jake's company took up four entire floors of a 15-story office building, and each floor had its own ample kitchen and dining areas. On two of the floors, he knew no one, On the third, he'd nurtured a smiling acquaintance with an older receptionist into a small morning chat that provided cover for his raids. At first, he'd considered his inroad with the receptionist a stroke of genius. Only later did he realize his mistake. His company was so large and the floor so chaotic that he easily traveled between all the staff rooms, once even carrying his plate on the elevator, without raising any suspicion at all. The key was moving fast and the receptionist's chit-chat slowed him down. Slowing down raised the possibility of getting noticed. With real regret, he'd come to write off the third floor unless he knew the receptionist was out sick. It was okay. The remaining refrigerators were always bountiful nibbling grounds. This particular burrito came from the first floor, and though he had no prior knowledge of it, Jake now felt like a benevolent force had guided his steps. 
The refrigerator had opened like a treasure chest, and the burrito wrapped in its foil shined like a bar of silver in that chest. What pirate would not have plundered it despite the breach in protocol? Stealing an entire burrito was not the nibble, after all. It was a gulp. He must have seen the burrito there days ago and factored its existence into his subconscious. He told himself it had been forgotten and could be safely swiped. Jake digested better with this thought in his mind. A clear conscience was always the grit in his birdseed. Four full bites later, his cell phone lit up and began to vibrate along his desk. Jake put the burrito aside and scooped the phone to his ear. Drama queen, Susan said. Jake's toes curled and dug through his socks into the soles of his narrow dress shoes. Susan continued, bold. I'm only calling because your voice sounded really strange. Like maybe you were hurt? Please tell me you were hurt. I'm not hurt. There's always tomorrow. I'll try back, Jake. An odd smacking noise came through before she hung up. Jake slumped and tried to assure himself this was only static. It sounded like she'd blown him a kiss. I need your help, Charlotte. Susan's poisoning me. Charlotte didn't even bother to wipe her glasses, which she normally did to stall for time whenever she didn't know what to think or say. Bullshit. She replied. Jake's expression sagged. It's true. I swear it's been happening. I thought you haven't been seeing her. I haven't exactly. We had a coffee two weeks ago. I haven't seen her since. You didn't tell me about that. I suppose you've been too busy to come in. Charlotte. She smiled. I thought you were telling me everything. It slipped my mind. That's how inconsequential it was. Remember when you talked about how she washed dress socks with athletic socks in the laundry? That is inconsequential, Jake. Fine. Is my death inconsequential, too? Sorry I bothered you. Just show me where the poison encyclopedia is. I can do my own research. He'd first come to the UHBD medical library three years ago, but he couldn't remember why. It wasn't close to anywhere he'd lived, and it was too specialized for general interest. Maybe he'd been researching a final college assignment. He met Charlotte right away. She wasn't a librarian, but she worked there shelving books. She really seemed to run the place. He'd asked her about spinal meningitis, and she told him to go to the reference desk. Instead, he persisted until she gave in and took him to the right section. He'd pestered her at odd intervals ever since. Now she led him to a shelf of poison and toxin handbooks and left him there. He pulled one book and then another, leafing without looking. The idea of researching the poison had empowered him. The research itself was too stifling. He needed to think, not learn. After twenty minutes, he strayed to the end of the row and looked for Charlotte. She was arranging a pile of papers and matching them to a stack of books on her beige pushcart. Charlotte, he said, approaching. Did you have any luck? No. Can you help? I'm not a librarian, Jake. You're better than a librarian. They won't lift a finger for you if they think it's going to take more than five minutes of their time. You're different. You listen. If you want my help, then you'll take my advice. If you think you've been poisoned, you should go to the doctor right now. The emergency room isn't even a block away. But frankly, you look fine. I'm very pale. You're always pale. I wasn't fine this morning, and I wasn't fine yesterday. Maybe you got a bug. Why do you think it was poison? I just know, okay? You get poisoned, your body tells you these things. Charlotte started to smile, but stopped, seeing Mr. Parker's grim march toward them from the reference desk. Mr. Parker was a library self-appointed doctrinarian, and the chief doctrine was that shelvers did not assist patrons especially the crazy ones. As I was saying, you really need to consult the reference desk. She said, and shoved her card away. Charlotte! Mr. Parker descended on him, like the weight of a tome. Back in his apartment, Jake stood before his bathroom mirror and assessed his health. He still felt weak and his muscles ached, but his skin color had returned. He suffered no fever, no chills. 
He'd been dismayed to find through Mr. Parker a very long list of poisons that all caused the same generic symptoms. But most symptoms are generic until they become your symptoms. Mr. Parker couldn't understand that. The librarian prodded for more details, but Jake could not be as open with him as he was with Charlotte. And even she didn't know about Susan's lipstick. Maybe it really was a bug or something. Germs were always going around as sprawling off as sniping at one cubicle or another. Maybe it was just his turn. Didn't that make more sense than poison? And what kind of poison could Susan have used that didn't take effect until two weeks after exposure? This question Jake did abstractly put to Mr. Parker, who after much fruitless searching admitted defeat. His cell went off in his pocket. He didn't recognize the number. Hello. Okay, Jake. I'm going to help you. He fell down on the toilet lid, breathing hard. Charlotte? Is that you? How did you get my number? I'm a library shelver, Jake. I can find out anything. The next day, Charlotte listened to him detail his symptoms, his theory, and his conclusion. His mannerisms reminded her of her first and favorite job in a dog shelter taking care of strays and orphans. They all seduced her with their cuteness, but every so often one did bite without provocation, and you could never know a biter in advance. She might laugh at the analogy until she thought more about it and about Jake and about risk. In an instant, she went from thinking of dog bites to being raped or strangled, and she wondered if she'd made a mistake. When Charlotte first saw Jake, she found him attractive in an unconventional way. He wasn't quite a geek or a nerd. He seemed athletic, though not a gym addict. But he fidgeted. He did so to the point it became distracting, and sometimes he fidgeted in his speech, too. On her first meeting, she thought he might be mildly autistic, and though there was no shame in that, it made her feel dirty to fantasize about him. Later, she determined him to be fine, though not normal. His presence annoyed her several times, and then one day she found that it didn't, and she knew she'd be in real trouble if he ever became a regular patron. They talked of his girlfriend Susan, but he had not graced the library in over two months when he came to research poisons. Lipstick. Yes. Make sure to write that part down. It is crucial. She smiled despite herself and did write it down in the flip notepad she'd pulled from her purse. I'm thinking that has to narrow down the field quite a bit. She said watching his fingers weave in and out of each other over and over again. What do you mean? Well, the poison would have to have certain properties. Chemical properties. Chemical properties. That's right. Thank God for you, Charlotte. He reached out automatically and grabbed her hand tight. The urgency of his grip pressured the bones, but she endured it and put her other hand over his. How do you feel, Jake? Good. Really good. An interesting poison. It only produces intermittent symptoms. Intermittent? I hadn't thought of that at all. Yeah. Write that down, too. She did, and said, So, you're okay right now? Oh, with you on my side? Charlotte, I feel great! The tremor in his fingers continued until he couldn't type, and then he knew he'd vomit across his keyboard. He jerked toward his trash can as the lunch came up in the same pie combination it had been going down. Jake moaned, clinging to the side of his desk as the world galloped away from him. A beehive of concerned voices swarmed at his back. After seven violent heaves, the nausea ended, leaving his abdominals wrung and torn. Still bent into the wastebasket, Jake raised a hand to acknowledge those behind him. I'm okay. He spoke into the amplifying trash can. I was choking. I stuck my finger down my throat. Guess I overdid it. <laughs> I'm really fine. He raised himself and there were just a few people remaining. One, Dave, gave him a hard slap on the back and then left. The others followed Dave's exit, all except Ellen. She'd stood there, looking very worried. Jake didn't want to acknowledge her, but he gave her a nodding smile and wiped the last tear from his strained eyes. Ellen kept staring. She was a mousy girl just out of high school, one of the endless numbers of interns the company used to massage its workflow. Jake had seen her before, but didn't know her very well. Her mother and father worked on the next floor. 
Are you really okay? Jake managed another smile. Ellen's gaze switched focus to his desk. What did you choke on? Uh, what? Oh, uh, pasta. That's quite a plate there. I make big suppers and have lots of leftovers. I just mix them all together. Keeps me from having to throw stuff out. Hmm. I brought ravioli to work today, too. Jake turned and saw the two squares of ravioli tucked halfway under a sprig of broccoli. He turned back to Ellen and found her walking away. Jake intended to endure the rest of the day through force of will, but the pain and stiffness built by the hour. At three, he had gravel poured in every joint and starch in his neck. He thought he could drive home, and he had sick time, so his supervisor released him without the usual passive-aggressive crap. When he collapsed into the driver's seat with the world spinning outside the windshield, he realized he'd never leave the parking garage. The sickness stalked him fresh, and his bowels housed a demon. I'll die here, he thought. Jake loved his car, which was no longer new and showed the battle-scarred dings and scratches from many urban jousts. Still, there was comfort in the notion of his car as his sepulcher. He eased the seat back and closed his eyes, intending to make peace with his life's mistakes. But the pain kept shaking him until he was a beaten thing that tossed and turned and screamed. He dialed Susan. This time she answered on the first ring. She knew. How did you do it? Do what, Jake? I want to know how. You sound like you're really in pain. Bitch, I am. That, that's good, Jake. It was your poison. I didn't poison you, Jake. She hung up. His phone dropped away and rolled someplace. Then agony electrified his body, reminding him he was its puppet. He fell forward and right, bent and writhing across the passenger seat as Susan's venom owned his veins. It was your poison! There was no sound quite like hearing his voice screaming in an empty car. Every word crunched his guts and made his voice weaker, but he screamed on past his last breath. It was your poison! It was your poison! It was your poison! It was your poison! (laughs) Jake, let me take you to the hospital. No. Charlotte draped the heavy blanket across his back and kept her right arm over his shoulder. She didn't know what else to do. She had stopped at his apartment on Thursday with a ream of research on various toxins, most of it too complicated to be valuable. She'd simply printed it with the goal of talking him out of his paranoia. That he might really be poisoned wasn't a consideration until he opened the door, swayed and slumped. Who would want to do this to you? Don't. No. Easy. You're shaking. I'm cold. She rubbed down his back with her hand. It was her poison. The the, the lipstick. Jake. She said, starting carefully. I don't think it was lipstick. No? For one thing, the symptoms aren't right. They... Well, you get the symptoms immediately, and you die soon after. What types of poison? What, Jake? How many poisons can be trans- uh, transmitted through lipstick? Only three. She guessed. To sound authoritative, she knew she must keep talking and give him no time to question. At first I thought Susan used strychnine. That's the most popular one for lipstick. But you'd already be dead. Even- Even if she just used a little bit? There's no such thing as just a little bit of strychnine, Jake. Jake's head bowed and his shoulders racked. He had been trembling so much that Charlotte didn't realize his sobbing right away. She clung to him tighter. Why? Why did she do this to me? What did she use on me? Easy, Jake. You're going to be okay. No, I'm not. With a burst of energy, he staggered up, the blanket falling away like a molt. He teetered, seemed ready to collapse, but somehow held on. Charlotte on the sofa stared at him in confusion. His face showed pain, terror, and a startling resolve. A plan was formulating in his head, some manic inspiration like the kind desperate trench generals get. 
She worried for him, and somewhat admired him, and waited for him to speak. I'm going to go vomit. Jake spent the weekend recovering, and by Sunday he tiptoed around like the floor was strewn with landmines. He felt better, but knew Susan's poison was biding its time in some unreachable part of him. He walked so as not to goad it. Charlotte stayed with him, and it was Friday night when he trudged into the dark living room and hoarsely announced she didn't need to sleep on the couch. That's kind of you, she said, and watched him zombie off toward his bedroom. On Saturday night, she followed. She made breakfast on Sunday, when Jake wanted to dare food again. She could do toast without charring it and made passable scrambled eggs. What, what did you do with these? Hmm? She asked, daydreaming. You're not eating. Why aren't you eating? I'm not hungry. Besides, I prefer watching you eat. I don't know that I trust a cook who won't eat her own food. Charlotte smiled because he was fidgeting again. Then she realized he was accusing her. You think I'd poison you? No, he muttered. You totally do. Jesus Christ, Jake. You've been unconscious most of the weekend while I've hung out in your living room. You don't even have cable television. If I wanted you dead, you'd have been really fucked. He finished his plate. Charlotte considered leaving, but she was too fascinated with his mannerisms to be offended. She also now thought he really had been poisoned. His condition and his own complete belief won her confidence. We have to find out who did this to you. It was Susan. Jake, if we're going to figure this out, then we have to get past the false accusations. Unless Susan is a ninja who can come and go as she pleases sight and scene, there's just no way she's the cause. Maybe the first time, but I doubt it. Unless there's something you're not telling me. What do you mean? Have you seen her more than you're letting on? No. Why, why would I want to do that? She's trying to kill me. She might want you dead, but that isn't the same thing. Well, it's close enough for me. I think your poisoner has to be someone you see on a more regular basis. Like at work. Well, great, that narrows it down to 800 people. Or maybe it's not someone, but something. Shit, Jake, did you ever consider that you just got food poisoning this time? That's always brutal. Does your office do potluck? Maybe someone made... No, forget that idea. What? Jake fidgeted forward. What idea? I was going to say someone brought in tainted food. But if that were the case, then half your office would be showing the same symptoms. Or at least everyone who ate it. Yeah, Jake said to himself. Everyone who ate it. What is it, Jake? He told her about the nibble. This is crazy. It isn't. Not really. Charlotte looked around Jake's office, which was a maze of cubicles and negotiating workers. At any given moment, 50 people were on their feet and gesturing like actors auditioning to be stock exchange floor extras. She heard endless clatter and chatter but saw no familiarity. Jake's work seemed like a place where people talked, but few said hello or goodbye, and men didn't ask other men about their wife or kids. The scene jarred her, and the library suddenly seemed like a cave she'd spent her whole life in. You'll need this. She took the badge, clipped it to her blouse, and suddenly became a corporate intern. It can't be this easy, Jake. Someone will know. There are always 60 interns at least. No one keeps track. No one will question. But what am I supposed to do? Jake handed her a stack of yellow and blue folders. Just walk around with these. Interns go all over the place and no one talks to them. You're a perfect spy. Okay, Jake. But what the hell am I trying to find? My poisoner. You're new, aren't you? Charlotte was plugging quarters into a staff room vending machine. Yes, she said. My name's Ellen. Charlotte, nice to meet you. Her potato chips were held hostage at the end of F4, but a little shove freed them. This was good because it seemed to be the last bag left in the entire building. 
She was surprised to find the vending machines on every floor rated bare. The library had only one small machine that got restocked every three months. She bent for the bag, and when she came up, she found Ellen opening a Tupperware plate from the refrigerator. Starving, Charlotte couldn't help coveting the enticing tortellini stuffed with spinach. That looks a lot better than this, Charlotte said. You can have some if you want. I've got plenty. Seriously? Sure. I love sharing my food with people who ask, Ellen replied and took another plate from the cabinet. The next day, Charlotte worked a four-hour morning shift shelving and got to Jake's office in time to see half the floor crowded around his cubicle. She ran up against a wall of backs and frantically tapped at one. What's happening? It's the guy in cubicle 260R, some kind of seizure. Jake! The floor supervisor ordered everyone to disperse, but no one complied until a paramedic squad cleared out a path. Charlotte darted into the opening and found Jake delirious, covered in vomit. His face so pale and slick that it was more like looking at a polished skull. His left hand jerked and flipped in a death fidget, and his right hand didn't work at all. As the medics lifted Jake onto the stretcher, Charlotte reached out to him. She was not the only one. Another hand came, fingertips pressing into Jake's shoulder. As the medics wheeled Jake away, Charlotte saw Ellen with her hand outstretched. They still regarded each other as the office drifted back to its regular affairs. Ellen entered Jake's cubicle and Charlotte followed. The odor of throw-up pungent and unattended. An office of this size must have an on-call janitorial staff, but Charlotte began to fear the interns were it. Why else did Ellen seem to be cleaning up? Then she saw the plate of food left on his desk and the half-eaten tortellini bejeweling the pile. It must have been something he ate, Ellen said. Oh my god. You. I'm just an intern, but I'm not stupid, Ellen said. My very first day here, two months ago, I caught him forking three mouthfuls of my lasagna onto his own plate. I felt so violated. I went to the intern as supervisor to complain. They didn't believe you. They did believe me. A man in his forties came up to them, eating from a small bag of Doritos. Hey, Dave, Ellen said. Dave smiled at Charlotte and looked at the plate. Damn, that's my broccoli on the side, I'm sure. He didn't get to it. Probably just as well. He's got three spears there. Three would have killed him. Is that Alan's meatloaf? Charlotte touched the base of her throat. You poisoned Jake? Why, we all did, Ellen said. It was the only way to make sure. Charlotte glanced around the office. Heads poked up in groundhog fashion from the farthest cubicles as closer ones emptied. Men and women came to flank Ellen and Dave. At that moment, Charlotte found the room, the entire floor, quieter than the library at its emptiest. Everyone? On every floor? You mean all the food in the refrigerators of every staff room is poisonous? That's impossible. It's... It was the only way to make sure... Ellen repeated. At first it became a sort of game, Dave explained. We got the idea in the lunchroom, just a few of us at first. Maybe we'd spit in our salad. Maybe we'd do something else. It went on by word of mouth. The other floors got involved, then the stakes got higher. I don't know who started poisoning their food first. My God, Charlotte whispered. But even 20 people poisoning their food in an office this large doesn't mean much, Dave continued. He went unerringly for the untainted dishes. He's got a real bloodhound in him. A talent for sniffing out the good from the bad. I started bringing in two Tupperware dishes, one with a red lid and one with a blue. We all agreed certain colors meant poison and others meant fine. Our code, in case we fucked up and forgot. We're a very safety-conscious office. Blue means safe. Sure enough... Jake stole from my blue plate and left the red alone. That's when we knew we needed 100% saturation. If he stole a scrap of food, he was going to get poisoned one way or the other. Jake knew what was happening, Charlotte said. He figured it out over the weekend. And he still stole our food? I guess you were right, Ellen. Some people are just too fucking stupid to learn. The Doritos bag crinkled as Dave's fingers scissored along the bottom of her stray bits. 
all accomplices. Charlotte turned to flee. She ran up against two men standing right behind her. They looked very hungry. Despite all the hustle and bustle, we're actually a very close-knit office, Ellen said, stirring the food with the fork. My internship is almost up. I really hope I get a real job here. I think there might be an opening quite soon. Dave and the other two men took hold of Charlotte's shoulders. They were gentle in their touch. Their force lay elsewhere, radiant and hard and implacable. It was in their eyes. Ellen stood in front of her. I won't say anything. Charlotte tried. Of course not, Ellen said, lifting the tortellini toward her. Polite people don't talk with their mouths full. Author's Note Hi, this is Sean, and I'd like to say thanks to the folks at Doomsday for podcasting my story. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, a bit about the story. First, I'm a reference librarian, and to anyone who writes fiction, I've just got to say that I can't think of a better job to have, because sometimes your entire day is filled with eccentric people who just come right up and practically beg your imagination to use them in a story. And that was the case for Jake, uh, with Jake in this story. Uh, I based him on a fidgety, somewhat insane older patron that I'd become fascinated with over the years. And I decided it would be fun to imagine him sort of in his early 20s and in love and working in this huge office environment that ends up being populated by just the ultimate type of passive-aggressive co-worker. The story itself, overall, I was just trying to have fun with the creep show or Tales from the Crypt type of plot. Uh, some of the plot aspects, like Jake's habit of stealing food from his co-workers, you know, I have to kind of admit that's sort of autobiographical, uh, which isn't to say that I've ever actually done it, but I have imagined myself doing it. And uh, I thought the idea would be an interesting uh, quirk for the character to have, his stealing food. And it ended up being... Uh, pretty much the crux of the story, because as I was writing it, I really had no idea who was poisoning Jake. And when I settled on, you know, this ridiculous idea of everyone in the building poisoning their lunches as a way of hoisting him by his own petard, um, I just, it made me laugh out loud, and I thought I was on the right track. Uh, before I go, I'd like to say thanks uh, to some people who read this story in various drafts and offered critiques. Uh, big thanks to Cassandra Greenwald as well as Paula Peterson and the members of my writer's group, and that's Linda, Ed, Dirk, Carter, and Nancy. And, of course, a big thanks to the Dune Steve staff for bringing this story into production. Uh, please feel free to contact me on Facebook. Uh, whether you thought the story was good or whether you thought it sucked, uh, it doesn't matter. Feedback is always great. So goodbye for now, and take care. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. I know Rish did, and Oedo T did. How about you? I did. And uh, how about you, announcer man? What did you? Where? Where did he go, dude? I think he ducked out like as soon as he was finished introducing us and went out to have a smoke, and he, he didn't even hear the story. You know, and you called him professional before. Yeah. You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh. Welcome back. No, we'd only mock you if you weren't here. No, no, yeah, we, we would never mock you, Announcer Man. Of course not. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you liked the story, Announcer Man? Uh-huh. And you weren't out smoking while we did the story? No. You sure about that? Well, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to come down on you, man, but it, it would help the conversation if you were here in the room when, when we talked. I don't know that he's... Have we ever had him share what he thought of a story or a scary experience, or his irrational fears, yeah, or you know, what he thought of the Dark Knight? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I'll get it done. I don't know what his deal is. It'd be, it would be great if just once, and it doesn't even have to be this week, he participated in a conversation. Yeah, seriously. How about that dollhouse, huh? Uh, oh, yeah, that, that's what we were talking about when you uh, when you came back in, right there. We, Right in the middle of conversation, talking about. <laughs> Joss Whedon is my master now. No, 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 no. Hey, you're just making things worse. Man. Yeah, you just need to give it up. So we're we're just going to move on. But thanks for uh, giving us your two cents. 
Why do you say this to me? Okay, okay. <laughs> He's funny. So if I recall uh, on his poisoner, wait, was it always called his poisoner? No, it wasn't. Oh, he had a number of titles. Or wait, no, I'm thinking of me. He ha his original title for the story was We Poisoned Jake. And pretty much everybody who read the story thought that was a bit of a giveaway, unfortunately, because it seemed like the whole story, Jake was trying to find out who was poisoning him. He's blaming his ex-girlfriend and not even considering the we that could have been poisoning him. And we thought it might be a little bit stronger of a story with a different title. Yeah, we suggested maybe you change it. And he's, he gave us a couple. And then I think you sent him a list of about 20 titles. Including my favorite. That girl is poison. Never trust a big butt and a smile. Yeah. Surprisingly, he didn't go for that one. So, yeah, he went back to a, an older title that he'd originally had for it, which was His Poisoner. So that's what the story's called now. I think it works better. At least it doesn't telegraph the ending on you. The ending is really strong. I think that was really what clinched it for me. Not only do you find out who the poisoner is, but then you have that completely dark and sinister turn where now Charlotte is in just as much trouble as Jake. And that's what really, I think, sold it for me right there. I was going to say the same thing. Love that last sentence of the story. If, if I remember right, you considered running this as one of our Halloween stories for, for in October. I did, yeah. I just really loved the whole creepiness and I guess that it would work as a Halloween story. I thought it was scary enough. Uh, it just wound up we were unable to, to manage to get that one in in October. It's just too hard for us to actually do four stories in one month. Hey, Pig, what? We actually did four stories. I mean, don't tell anybody, but we did do four stories in October. Oh, yeah, that's right. But, hey, let's continue whispering just to really mess up that guy who listens to the show while he rides his bike to work in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Poor bastard. Can you imagine riding yes. your bike to work? Seriously. Uh, and what's worst is it's not even a bicycle. It's a tricycle. How does it fit? Tricycles are small. So is he. I'm sorry. I should have come up with something funnier. Let's talk normal voice now. You know, maybe it wouldn't have been a perfect fit in October because if you know that it's supposed to be a scary story, if you didn't know what the genre is and you're just listening to it, you could think, well, this guy is crazy, completely paranoid. Nobody is trying to hurt him. Right. He might even be a hypochondriac, and that's why he's always sick and throwing up and stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Yes. I wonder if it grossed out a lot of people because there's tons of vomiting in this story, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even for us, for the Dune Steve, there's a lot of vomiting. And we love our vomiting, so... Not this time. It's like, oh, now you're participating in the conversation. Yes, sir. When was the last time you vomited? Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. I, you know, I didn't expect him to say that. How about you? No. Maybe Announcer Man is crazy and a hypochondriac. What does all this have to do with anything? Yes, thank you. You did participate. We'll mark that little box in, in your... Your evaluation uh, form. Yes. You can give it to your uh, parole officer. Uh, just one more little thing about this story. And uh, now it's time for Rish's off-topic ramble of the week. It reminds me, actually, of something that happened to me. Oh, uh, yeah? A few years ago, when I had like four roommates, all of us at the same time, I would buy these uh, two-liter bottles of soda, and I would put them in the fridge, and one of my roommates would drink them, like either early in the morning <laughs> while I was asleep or during the night, whatever, but I would go there, open the fridge, and there'd be, oh, there'd be like a quarter inch left in the container. And he, I guess, had thought that if you leave that much in and then put it back, we didn't drink it all or, or, <laughs> or whatever, again, justification that crazy people make. Anyway, so I got a Sharpie and I started writing out, you know, outfield or, or, or something on there, you know, I was like, do not drink kind of thing. And it kept happening. And so... One day during lunchtime, when all of us happened to be around, I said, oh, hey, I, I wanted to mention that uh, from time to time in the future, I'm going to start putting x lax in these two liter bottles that I bring in. And I won't mention anybody when I do it, but sometimes they're going to have a great deal of x lax in them. And one of my roommates said, you f***ing I don't give a f*** if we're on a 
f***ing or not, God damn it. You do that and I will f***ing kill you. And it was just like, whoa. He was incensed to the point where it's just like, I will bleep and kill you. Oh, hey, RWT, you mind? Yeah, bleep that for us, would you, O8OT? Thanks. Um, family show. Oh, come on. It's not a family show, is it? Like they poisoned Jake. Oh, that's true. Good old poisoning. <clears throat> so at least you knew who was drinking well, it then. What was weird was I was shocked, honestly, by this reaction because it was fury, but not just fury, but righteous indignation <laughs> on this person's part. But what surprised me almost as much was that my other three roommates immediately joined his side and were like, yeah, you tell him. And I was just like, what the crap, man? But I wasn't really going to buy X slacks. It was just a threat that I was saying. So whoever it was would stop drinking my soda. Uh, anyhow, so this was an experience that surprised me. It was it was unpleasant. I was reminded of it and I couldn't help but sympathize with Jake, even though he's an unsympathetic guy. Yeah, he's the guy that's uh, screwing everybody else, stealing from them. You were on the other end, the person that was getting stolen from, being irritated, and yet because of the reaction you got, you actually sympathize with Jake instead of with the people who are being stolen from like you were. It's funny. That was always a problem. You know, when I was in college and I had roommates and they were always stealing from one another, you know, that there's food there and you'd snag some of it. And it's, it's just funny how that is, how that that's such a universal thing. And there's always the people putting their initials on their food or whatever. I actually did when we were in film school. We had to do a commercial in one of our classes, a 30 second commercial. And the idea that I came up with was a got milk commercial where... <laughs> These roommates come out in the morning and they get into the cupboard and there's like this cereal and it's got this guy's initials written all over it. And they pull the cereal down, fill up their bowls, and then they open up the fridge and there's the milk with this guy's initials all over it. And they pull out the milk and they fill their cereal bowls up and they chow it down and they pour themselves a big glass of milk and drink it. And then one of them actually takes the milk jug and upends it over his face and it runs all down his chest and everything like that. And then uh, all of a sudden they hear their roommate's alarm go off and they're like, oh, crap. And they put their stuff away and put the milk back in the fridge and take off. And then the uh, roommate comes out, gets out a cereal, puts it into the bowl, goes to pour his milk and a tiny dribble comes out and he goes, ah! And then the God God milk. milk comes up. No, that was the idea that I went with because it was just such a common thing is people snatching from other people. And where I work, it's the same thing. They actually have to put a big friggin' sign up on the door. And it's one of those signs meant to shame people to uh, keep them from stealing other people's food out of there where it just says, you know, just because it's in the fridge doesn't mean you can help yourself to it. If it's not yours, don't eat it. You know, there's been several times where I've gotten a 12-pack of soda, brought it into work, put it in the fridge, and I'm lucky to get six cans out of it before it's gone. Other people will actually drink more than half of my 12-pack on me if I leave it in the fridge. Now, so if, if you were to get some of those plastic bottles of – what kind of soda are you talking about? Uh, Mountain Dew. Of Mountain Dew. And you filled each bottle half with Mountain Dew and half with your own urine. <laughs> you would go to jail, not the guys that are stealing your Mountain Dew. True. Yeah. You know, I've actually thought of getting a, like a big sticker that says like, this can has been stolen from Big Anklevich or whatever. Oh, something great. like that. So that anybody who takes it, it has to walk around with a can that says that on it. It's not anonymous that way. I don't know. Now, if you did that, would your coworkers say, oh, what an a-hole? Maybe the ones who steal would say that. And I think that was the problem with your roommates. The ones that were stealing from you were pissed off because you were telling them that they were wrong. And most likely, if all three of them turned on you, they were probably all getting themselves sips of that stuff. That makes perfect sense. I wish we could time travel back and you could... Say, hey, this too will pass. <laughs> and they... That's the way it is, you know. Some no, People don't want someone to point out that what they're doing is wrong. That's why they stone and murder prophets in days of old. I'm sorry, I, I, I was uh, 
thinking of having a smoke with the announcer man over there. What, <laughs> what, 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 did I miss something important? <laughs> I was just preaching. You must repent. You must repent. Hand, hand, hand. Well, Sean, thank hand, you for sharing us that story. Help me. Uh, I hope you liked the way that we read it and everybody else. Ditto. Except for the sharing the story with us. Well put. That's why they pay me the big bucks, my friend. That is. It's why they haven't nominated me for Parsec. It's just that I'm that bad. Hey, before we shut off the whole thing, I, I got to ask you, man, what, what does the word Dune Steve mean? You know, while I got you here. <laughs> wow. Dune Steve. That takes me back. What, we're hearing the word Dune Steve takes you back? Yeah. Because <laughs> we say it a lot on this show. I mean, nearly every week. It really makes me remember those days. Th those days, huh? Well, you, tell me about it. We'd all like to be let in on the nostalgia, right? Okay, well, uh, the name Dune Steve comes from the, uh, the 90s when I was a teenager in Guam. Me and my friends, uh, we all got together and formed a rap group. Really? I, I hate rap. What a coincidence. Yeah. We decided to name our group uh, based on all of our names. It's uh, a an anagram. Not one of those words is it spelled the same backwards and forward. Uh, that's a palindrome, I think, but it's close. Oh, it's, it's a word that sounds like the sound that it is. What is that, onomatopoeia? <laughs> what, is it? what is an anagram? <laughs> an anagram is uh, the name where the letters all stand for something, I think. And Dune Steve is an anagram. Right. Yeah, each letter stands for the name of uh, one of the members of the group. So there was D Mac, and he was the D. Oh, well, is that Doug McIntyre? I, I didn't know you knew him back then. Uh, I didn't. No, it's, uh, it's not Doug McIntyre. Uh, that was another guy I knew uh, from my youth. His name was Doug Mikentry. Oh. Yeah, then there was uh, U Boat. And uh, Nightcrawler, and uh, Ed the Cracker Killer, and Steve, and uh, T Bone Gangsta, and Easy G, and Easy T, and Fat Tuesday. Yeah, I've never heard of any of these guys. Yeah, but you know, it's cool that one of the guys in your group didn't use that stupid pseudonym hip hop thing. Uh, what do you mean? Well, the, the guy Steve, you said? He just goes by Steve. Oh, <laughs> no, that was his hip-hop pseudonym thing. His real name was Chad. Uh, so, anyway, we called ourselves the Dune Steve Clan. Wait, 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 Clan? Like yeah. K-L-A-N? No, we'll see. Oh, oh, yeah. well, then, then it's all right. I guess. So we, we were really good, and, like, Death Row Records was about to sign us. To a six album deal. No way. But then the uh, Wu Tang Clan came out and they hit it big, so they told us that we were too much like them. Well, but did you sound just like them or something? No, it's just the name thing mostly. Oh, well, 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 so why didn't you just, you know, change your name to the Dune Steve Gang or the Dune Steve Brotherhood or something like that, you know? You could have still become big hip hop stars, dude. You got no clue. You gotta have artistic integrity, man. You'd do anything for money, wouldn't you? you sell out, probably. Anyway, that's what Dune Steve comes from. It's just my little private nostalgia trip. Hmm. Well, you know, speaking of doing anything for money, we pay our authors, and the only way that we can pay those authors is if we form a little hip-hop band ourselves. No, the only way we can pay the authors is if we get donations from our listeners. Yeah, that'll be more likely to get us money than me and you forming a hip-hop group. Well, no, no, okay. If, if we formed a hip-hop group, what would your name be and what would my name be? I'm going to pick one for you. Tubby Once Athletic ank ank Ankle-It, bitch. Nice. Ank, 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 ankle Leech. Ank, ank. Ank Williams Jr. Ank. What are those Egyptian symbol things? I think they're called onks. Damn. Can you be but big? It is spelt with an A. Could you be big Anklevich from now on? 
Yeah, that would be a good hip hop name. Yeah. Oh yeah. We could try. Maybe. Oh, we could pretend like you're a Canadian dude, and you could be Rich Oatfield. I love it. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. Next week, tune in for the Dune Steve Clan. Oh, oh are we the Dune Steve Clan? I thought wait. we were Onk Oatfield. Yeah. yeah. So next week, tune in everybody for Onk Oatfield's debut performance. It's really cool. I've never written a rap song before. I can't wait. Yeah, me neither. Do they have to rhyme? Uh, I don't think anything rhymes anymore these days. It's just, you just talk. Okay. Shoot, we should have told people that they could uh, click on that PayPal button on the site. Next next week, after the song, we'll do that. Okay, yeah, we'll tell them about clicking on the PayPal button at, to donate to our show next week. Cool. All right, so uh, I guess that's our show for today. Sorry. It was our worst show ever. Not that the story was bad. I, th- I think it was announcer man's fault. Yeah, really. I will kill you. So this week, uh, we got an email from the folks at the Drabblecast, from Norm Sherman himself, for that matter, telling us... To die. Well, he was actually writing to... To ask me to stop sending Drabbles, because he's never going to publish a single one. <laughs> he's never going to podcast a single one. As a matter of fact, yes, he also said that. And I said that there's you, you're more likely to get rich to die than to stop sending Drabbles in. Um, so, no, actually, he wanted us to uh, help him out with a story. And to move a body. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. It's very late. Yeah, he wanted he wanted uh, us to give him a hand on a story. The story that we uh, supplied some, some voices for was called Now Let Us Praise Awesome Dinosaurs. I, yes. I, I pray he does it in that voice when he <laughs> says the name of the story. And you can tell just by the title that it's a, it's a story made for Drabblecast. This story is by Leonard Richardson, and uh, yeah, it just went up on the uh, on the Drabblecast site. So we're putting a link to it up on the uh, website, and you can go check it out and take a look at it and give it a listen and just enjoy yourself. Drabblecast dot org. I just I love the dot org. I remember when we first started the show, you kept trying to get me to say .org, and I said, no, it could be either. You know, you could do that with us. You could still say dunesdeep.org, and it would come up to .com. You're kidding. Type it in. I want to okay. see. That's see? porn, man. My mom! Take that off right now. <laughs> All right, so I'm Big Anklevich. This is embarrassing. And I'm Rish Outfield. I want to taste you. But your lips are venomous. Poison. Your poison running through my veins. Good night, folks. It really was the worst episode ever. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. She worried for him, and someone admired him and waited for him to speak. I'm going to go vomit, he said. Oh, yuck. Yesterday I was watching My Little Pony with my cousin with Down Syndrome. I was watching it, and there was absolutely no conflict in that show at all. (laughs) And I leaned over it to the six-year-old, and I was like, this is horse shit, man. All it is is them having a party, and it's like, oh, well, who's going to sit where? And he's like, how can you watch this utter crap? <laughs>